Hi everyone, this is Rod from the Alchemist Den, our esoteric and hermetic study society. Um, please bear with me all the mistakes that I'm going to go through during this presentation because it's the very first time for me to use the narration over the PowerPoint. Um, I'll try to do my best. Actually, this is a lecture about the uh, Toth Tarot. It was held on April 19th, 2020. And um, yeah, so I thought it would be good to have uh, something, uh, a record of, of the presentation. Okay, let's go through it. Uh, talking about the Thoth Tarot, um, some background information about it. And obviously, we have to start with um, Alistair Crowley. Well, uh, Alistair Crowley, love him or hate him. Um, he was definitely one of the most influential figures of the uh, occult uh, scene in the Victorian period. Uh, the information that you see is just taken straight from uh, Wikipedia, so it's something that everybody can check out. Um, I say love him or hate him because uh, the world of, of uh, occultism is kind of divided. Uh, definitely, he was a very influential figure. Um, not only an occultist, he was a uh, poet, a painter, a novelist, and a mountain climber. And most of all, he's famous for the uh, founding of the Thelema philosophy in the early 1900s after he joined and left, not in good terms, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn. And, uh, well, this is a particular, uh, it's very important for the relation that he has with the Toth Tarot because the Toth Tarot is mainly based on um, the philosophy of Thilema, especially because he thought um, that uh, we would be entering or we are entering into the new eon, as he called the eon of Horus, which is pretty much what the new age think as, um, uh, say, the age of Aquarius. And uh, in this new eon, um, the, the, the tarot that um, we were currently using before, like the uh, Raider White uh, or the, the, the other tarot that we were using, were kind of obsolete. So we wanted to bring a new tarot deck, which was more in tune with uh, the uh, philosophy of the new eon. And therefore, he came up with the... Uh, he came out, it, it, basically thought about the new deck, uh, and that's how the Toth Tarot started to take shape. Of course, we have to mention also about um, Frida Harris. Frida Harris was the lady that actually helped him paint, uh, draw and paint the deck, um, commonly referred as Lady Frida Harris, after that he um, married, um, actually her husband, was made baronet in 1932. That's why we refer her as uh, Lady Frida Harris. And you see her in... Next again, uh, for some background information, um, this is actually very interesting information, the fact that both of them, uh, both Crowley and, um, and Harris, didn't actually have a chance to see the deck printed. Uh, actually, they were both dead when the first uh, release of the deck was issued in 1969 by the OTO, by the Orto Templi Orientis, and you've seen the picture, the very first um, release, the very first print of, of the deck. Um, and of course, another very important information is that the whole deck is based on the Book of Toth. The Book of Toth, which is definitely something very hard to read. Um, it's packed with information, Crowley style information, so you need to have very, uh, how to say, deep understanding of what uh, Crowley was trying to mention in, in this book. Nevertheless, this book was um, recorded in the Vernal Equinox of 1944. It was originally published in a, a limited edition of uh, 200 copies, and the book is divided in uh, four sections. The part one is the theory of the tarot. The part two is about the atu, or the major arcana, as we refer to in the classic tarot. 
um, the part three about the court cards, so the kings, the queens, the prince and princesses, and the part four is related um, to the small cards. Um, another interesting information is that um, most of you may have noticed uh, when looking at the top star or the, the perspective of the pictures are quite strange. Um, it seems like the image is whirling in and out and he has a kind of particular perspective to it. This is not random and actually was based on um, Harry's deep study of what was called what is called projective geometry. This is uh, was uh, as Harris was a disciple of um, Rudolf Steiner, and Rudolf Steiner was a famous occultist. And one of his uh, studies was involving this style of representation of reality called projective geometry, where uh, you have a more than one polarity between a central point and a distant surface. Um, the relation between center and periphery. Uh, basically is based on the time space kind of representation and that's why some figures of the uh, top deck are kind of like uh, seems going in and out from the card and the other three pillars where the top deck is, is, is based on of course is Kabbalah, sex magic and the book of the law which we mentioned before the reason also why Crowley changed some cards and um, basically wanted to bring a new idea, a new deck for the new eon of Horus, which is uh, at the basis of his uh, philosophy of Thelema. These are basically the major difference between the Toth Tarot and the classic. I'm comparing it with the most popular and most used uh, Raider weight uh, tarot deck. And uh, you see the difference is basically, well, the king is called the knight, queen's is queen. The knight became the prince and the page becomes the princess. There is also a difference uh, in the major arcana beside the magician that is just replaced with the uh, name the Magus, but pretty much the meaning is the same. Um, the strength is replaced with lust. Um, justice is adjustment, which is a really tiny adjustment or change to it. Temperance becomes art. Judgment becomes the eon, the eon that we just mentioned earlier. And the world become the universe. We start, uh, first of all, to understand the whole structure of the deck. We start to review a little bit the Kabbalistic view of the universe. The Kabbalistic view of the universe is based on a very old, uh, maybe the oldest book uh, about um, Jewish mysticism. And it's called the Sefer Yetzira. In the Sefer Yetzira basically is explained how God created uh, the world. When we talk about God, we're not talking about any specific kind of uh, uh, God, but we're talking about the one, the, the what's above everything. Um, doesn't matter which name actually you want to give to it. And according to the Sefer Yetzira, um, as you see and I can read it says the Lord of the host the living God the king of universe the omnipotent all kind and merciful supreme and extol who is eternal sublime and most holy ordained or formed and created the universe into 32 mysterious path of wisdom by three sepharim namely the Sfar, Sipur and Safar which are he in him one and the same they consist, and this come the most important part, of a decade out of nothing and 22 fundamental letters. He divided the 22 consonants into the three divisions of three mother fundamental letters, 
or first element, seven double letters and 12 simple letters or consonant. Consonant is because Hebrew didn't actually have, uh, the Hebrew alphabet didn't actually have uh, vowels, uh, vocals in the, in the, in their alphabet, so it's mainly consonants, and that's also the reason why the pronunciation of um, Hebrew words is left a little bit to free inter interpretation. But nevertheless, these 22 letters that uh, actually they were uh, copied uh, as they are from the Phoenician alphabet, actually, but according to the Seferi Thira. They were the emanation of God, and they, uh, through these 22 letters, God itself created the universe. Most likely you are familiar, or you would have seen this picture, um, the Tree of Life, which comes pretty much uh, commonly in the occult texts. And this is the visual representation of what we just mentioned what we just read out of the Seferi Thira, and you see the ten Sephirot, the ten uh, spheres, connected by 22 paths, going from the top, which is the highest or the highest vibration or the conscience of God, or basically what we call the closest to nothing, where everything is possible and downward, coming spiraling downward down to uh, Malkut, the world, the world of creation, or where we dwell as, as a human being, where we have our tables and chairs and cars and our life revolve. And basically, is, I put the dot there, you see, you are, you are here. So that's where we are in uh, the number 10, or Malkut. And above us is the whole tree of life of uh, mystery of creation, according to the Jewish, Jewish mysticism. One point to remember, which is the, the most important part to move forward, is the downward part is from the purest, godlike form in the top trinity, down changing vibration, mixing with energy and matter until the material world, or until the Malkut. Next, now we just saw the um, Kabbalistic view of the universe. Now we'll see our Western or Hermetic view of the universe, where we usually talk about four elements, fire, water, air and earth. Actually, it should be three elements because earth is not really a pure element as fire water and air but earth is a byproduct of those three so earth is a byproduct of fire water and air so it's not really a pure element although in the hermetic uh, tradition we consider earth as the fourth element then we have seven planets the seven planets according to the old tradition. So Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Venus, Mercury, Moon and Sun. And finally, we have the 12 zodiacal signs of, from Aries to Pieces. And this is pretty much what we are used to see studying uh, Western occultism. These are the major reference that we have. So the three or four elements, seven planets and 12 zodiacal sign. So how do we connect the hermetic view of the universe to the Kabbalistic view of the universe? Again, we said we have four elements, seven planets and 12 zodiacal sign. What we do, we just go matching. The Hebrew alphabet of the 22 letters that we saw explained in the Sefer Yitzira, where we have the three mother letters, the seven double letters, and the twelve simple letters. These are allocated exactly in 
uh, the relation as you see it on in the presentation. The three mother letters represent the three purest elements of air, water and fire. The seven double letters represent the seven planets. And finally, uh, the 12 simple letters are assigned or corresponding to the 12 zodiacal signs. Then, we saw the Kabbalistic universe, we've seen how to match it with the Hermetic universe, and now the next we have the Tarot universe. The Tarot universe is, is made of 22 major arcana and four suits divided in 16 court cards, so all the kings and queens and princes and princesses, and 40 minor arcana, which are the cards from 2 to 10 in the four suits. Again, I'm taking the three structure, starting from the uh, 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet and putting them back with the correspondence with our four elements, seven planets and zodiacal signs, as exactly as we see before. And now I'm gonna add the tarot correspondence. So we see the three mother letters or the three elements are assigned starting with the full representing the air, the hanged man representing the water and the eon representing the fire. And then next we have the seven planets or the seven double letters. These are pretty straightforward to understand as we know Traditionally, for instance, Thoth is uh, the god of magic, is the god of knowledge, is, is represents magician, and magician is represented by Mercury. So assigning Mercury to the magician or the magus is pretty straightforward, as much as straightforward assigning Jupiter, the planet of abundance, the, the planet of uh, good things, is easy to uh, assign it to the uh, deck to the to the card of the fortune, the wheel of fortune. Mars, which is difficult, a difficult planet, is assigned to the tower. Moon is assigned to the high priestess, being even this, but it's straightforward. And Saturn, which is the oldest god before. Jupiter is assigned to the um, arcana of the universe. Next, we have to allocate the 12 to the zodiacal sign. And here you see in that uh, diagram, starting with the Aries, we have the Emperor. And next we have Pieces assigned to the Moon. We have Aquarius assigned to the Star. Capricorn assigned to the devil, Sagittarius assigned to art, Scorpio assigned to death, Libra assigned to adjustment or justice, uh, Virgo assigned to the hermit, Leo assigned to lust or strength in the classic deck, we have Cancer assigned to chariot, we have the lovers assigned to Gemini, and we have the Hierophant assigned to Taurus. So here in this picture you have the three universe, the three uh, philosophies, the three pillars of, of these views matched together in uh, what are the three correspondences. Now, if you remember the diagram of the Tree of Life coming out from the description of the Safari Thira, and I take the image back right there. And uh, I'm going to, what we're going to do, we're going to allocate each major arcana, or a two, as Alistair Crowley called them, into the path of the Tree of Life. I'm sorry, the Tree of Life picture has the 
uh, weight uh, tarot representation uh, but pretty much I think it gives the idea so we have 22 paths on the tree of life and we allocate each of these paths to one of the 22 Atu or major arcana of the uh, tarot deck as you see the magician of the magus is connecting the first uh, sephiro to the number three as well as the fool is connecting the number one to the number two and we are still in the highest vibration of the tree of life and so on and so forth now if we look at the toth uh, representation in the card we see that uh, uh, Crowley was nice enough honestly this I don't know if but originally um, it was made this way or it came later this this uh, this um, representation but was nice enough to let us know exactly this correspondence in fact if you see uh, in the bottom of the of the card you see the symbol of um, mercury which is uh, the representation of the magician of the magus and the letter beth the hebrew letter beth which is uh, the path connecting kether the sephi number one to the number three next we talk about how to assign the minor arcana into the tree of life and this is pretty much straightforward because you have the 10 sephiroth and then uh, it's pretty easy to assign 1 to 10 with the 1 to 10 number of the minor arcana starting from the aces on the top and moving downward until the 10th so basically if we recall a little bit that this tree of life represent uh, from the purest form the highest vibration on the top and it goes all the way down spiraling down until the world the material world where we live we can see that the aces are the highest or the purest representation of their own suit while the tenth are the closest um, card representing our material world and everything in between and this is what we say so from the element purest form to its most polluted one spiraling down through the energies of creation so the more we go up with the number I mean we go lower with the number we're talking about higher frequencies less material and the more we move downward we relate more and more to our material world when we talk about the cards you have to imagine like uh, like in the picture that you see is like uh, um, the first assumption which is not really an assumption but it is is the whole tarot deck leaves inside the full the full is assigned the number zero and exactly as the number zero is the no nothing or the no thing where everything is then in the number zero all numbers are included and exactly in the full the whole tarot deck the whole concept of creation is included so when we look inside try to imagine looking inside the tarot deck as you look inside like a like a staircase like that um, you look inside the full and what you see is the four aces and then you look inside the four aces and you see the four suits everything is like downward so the whole tarot deck lives inside the full and all the uh, number two from the minor arcana from the two to ten live inside their own ace which represent the purest form of their own uh, suit of their own uh, element and then we move on to the uh, court cards and this is 
where we have a relation with sex magic. Again, I'm using the diagram of the tree of life, recalling where we are. And if I assign the court cards in the tree of life, you see on the top we have the queens and the knights. In the middle we have the prince or the knight in the classic deck. Finally, lower down we have the princesses or the page. As we say, we live in the 10th Sephiroth, we live in, in Malkut, we live in the bottom. So we are the princesses. Now, if you remember the story of uh, Sleeping Beauty, the, um, the princess that waits for her prince to be awakened by a kiss. Actually, this story is a very Kabbalistic story somehow because it's a representation of how we climb the tree of life. So we are the princesses down there, we are sleeping down there, we don't know what's going on, we don't know that there is more to uh, our universe, our creation, that the world we see. So we are sleeping and we are waiting for our prince to come over and awaken us. Why this is the one of the secrets of sex magic? Because once the princess is awakened by a kiss of the prince or basically the prince and the princess get together they will become automatically the queen and the king so through this union they will be allowed to move up in the tree of life when we talk about moving up the tree of life means we're going to have a shift on consciousness so our consciousness is going to get a higher level so who's this actually prince that we need to wait for who's this prince that is going to come and kiss us and and actually awaken us to the next level of consciousness this prince is what we call or it's called the holy guardian angel or higher consciousness or this many way holy guardian angel is one of the most common uh, or the genius is the highest part of ourself is is our connection between the godhead and the material world in crowley in in Tram is called the holy guardian angel which is actually coming from uh, book, uh, an old book, a Jewish book uh, of um, Abram, Abram Helin, um, which explains an operation on how to get in touch and to have a knowledge and conversation with this guardian angel. So once we know our guardian angel and once we fall in love and we are completely making love with our guardian angel, we will have a shift of consciousness, consciousness which will allow us to climb up the tree of life. Okay, this is something that of, for sure 500 years ago I would have got burned at stake to have not only myself but pretty much everybody was bringing on this 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 discussion would have been burned at stake. I have this problem these days. Next, um, this is uh, what actually gives the card their meaning. Have you ever wondered why the Five of Wands is it's a difficult card, or the Two of Cups is the card of love, or the Six of Wands is the card of victory? If you ever wonder where and how this 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 meaning has been um, allocated to the cards. Now we try to see it a little bit. So we take our <clears throat> uh, zodiacal wheel, which from the uh, modern astrology starts at zero degrees Aries, which is see you see it marked as number one. That's Aries at zero degrees starting and moving anti-clockwise until the number twelve in pieces. This is what 
actually astrology is commonly agreeing on and this is the 360 degrees wheel of the zodiac in which each sign covers 30 degrees so the 1 to 12 is the each 30 degrees angle to fill the zodiacal wheel one thing we need to keep in mind is that um, water uh, is corresponding to cups fire correspond to wand earth correspond to discs or pentacle and air correspond to swords now as we know from astrology um, signs are also assigned or corresponding to one of the four elements we have cancer scorpion pieces that are water sign we have aries leo and sagittarius which is which are uh, fire signs and then we have capricorn taurus virgo that are earth signs and we have um, libra aquarius and gemini which are air sign if we have if we keep this correspondence like water is cup fire is wand earth is discs and air is words what we do is basically divide the 30 degree of the zodiacal wheel into a smaller part what we call the deacons the deacons are actually breaking the 30 degree angle into three degree into three parts of 10 degree each so we will have three deacons for aries three deacons for taurus three deacons for uh, gemini three deacons for cancer and so on once we divide the 30 degrees into the 10 related deacons and we look at the corresponding elements in the table that you see right in the middle what for example what we see is the starting from aries starting from aries aries is a fire sign fire correspond to wand so what we do we start to allocate the wands as in the deck to aries two three and four we start from two because aces as we say before aces represent the whole um, suit of their own card is inside the aces so aces is, will be outside of this picture as well as the court card will be outside of this picture um, actually the representation of the court cards and aces will be outside this circle i'm not going into that detail because it would be a little bit more complicated so uh, just for this time bear with me and we will stick to the card inside within the aces and the court cards allocating so for aries the two of one three of one and four of one next we have taurus taurus is an earth sign so corresponding to disc or pentacle or coins whatever you want to call it and we keep on with the number so we are at four of one next we will have the five of pentacles six of pentacles seven of pentacles next we have gemini and gemini you see in the table correspond to air is an air air sign which relates to swords and then we continue we put the eight of sword nine of sword ten of sword so basically once we feel the whole wheel in this way we have this representation where you have the sign you have the number of the card and you have the planet now let's take a look for instance at the, at the six of wands the six of wands represent victory um, in all pretty much all the decks so what's going on with this victory if you look at the six of wands what is it? it is basically telling us that you have jupiter in leo so jupiter the planet of the the great 
um, benefactor, the great god of like happiness and, and fulfillment and, and all the good things that Jupiter may bring on, is in, uh, is in Leo. Leo is a planet of, uh, sorry, is, is a sign of uh, strength. Leo is a very aggressive, is very um, strong and very, um, how to say, he um, keeps basically things in place. So when we have this Jupiter, this, this, this happy planet into a strong uh, sign like Leo, we can only have an outcome of victory. And here we go. And again, in the Toth, Tarot is nice because it's written in there. You have in the bottom, you see the sign, the, the, the glyph of the, of the Leo. The, the sign and on the top you have the uh, glyph of Jupiter so looking at the card not only you have the representation of the six of wands but the Toth Tarot also tell us what is the representation in uh, in the zodiacal wheel so we have Jupiter in Leo last thanks for coming all the way here if you are is a very quick i'm not going into the details because this is really it would take on a, a lecture just just to talk about this but it's it's about the colors of the card you have noticed the color of the toth tarot are kind of um sometimes challenging and uh, sometimes you're wondering why there is this kind of like colors that are sometimes are almost difficult to digest um actually the colors in the Toth Tarot, but also in the red and white, but more in the Toth Tarot, are they have a specific purpose and specific meaning to it. When we talk about the Sephiri Theta, when we talk about the Tree of Life, we talk that the number one um, is the purest form. It goes down all the way to 10, which is the most polluted form. Now, it's exactly the same when we talk about light. When light is the purest white light, go through a prism it breaks down into the color of the seven colors the seven basic colors and that's exactly what happening in the representation of the color of the Toth Tarot so light the purest light on the top of the tree of life breaks down and breaks down in different colors and this color are matched which with different scales and every scale like the knight the queen the prince the princess has its own scale which is mixed with the colors of the elements and there's mixed so each card is basically has a very uh, fixed and 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 decided kind of set of colors to be used a common way to see this happening in the Toth Tarot is pretty much if you take the aces like as you see the ace of wands is a is assigned to fire and it's a bright red number one if you see the number 10 is rest are to be polluted because it's going through the tree of life is getting mixed with other energy and it comes all the way down until our Malkut until our number 10 so this red is not going to be the purest and and brightest red that you have when it was or when it is at the ace level same thing for the cups where you have the predominant blue color we have the swords with the yellow color and the ace of disc which is the earth and one of the most difficult one because it's a byproduct of the other three elements and we have the green and and we have the brown and and some black and so on and so forth and that's pretty much all about this uh, this small Toth Tarot in a nutshell of course there is much 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 more to explain but this will go beyond the scope of this small presentation so we reached the end um, thank you so much for bearing with me thank you so much for uh, bearing with all my mistakes through this this presentation and I hope you uh, enjoyed it and I hope you liked it some reference for you um, 
of course Wikipedia for the information about Alistair Crowley and Frida Harris. Uh, I strongly recommend Long Mile to Cat book Understanding Alistair Crowley's uh, Thoth Tarot, which is an amazing, uh, insightful, beautiful book to understand this, this, this deck. Of course, Alistair Crowley's Book of Thoth, where all the information about this deck are recorded in there. Robert Wang with his Kabbalistic Tarot is another really great book. And um, well, if you want to know a little bit more also about the, the last of Babylon and, and the story about it, I also recommend to see the movie The Ninth Gate with Roman Polanski. It's, it's, it's pretty much um, has a very strong Toth Tarot flavor, especially toward the end, but I don't want to spoil the movie. so enjoy it eventually if you didn't see it before thank you very much and hope to have you with us again next time have a great day